So I'll open the floor now. We have about 15 or so minutes. Uh, I know people's lunch break is very precious and they have to get back. And also, if you have a car parked out here with a ticket on it, they're devils for putting uh, clamps on them. So just be careful if anybody needs to increase their parking. So who, who wants to raise something now from the floor? It's always... The first question is always difficult. I know we have members of the Gardaí here. We're very honoured to have the DPP here. Um, but is there something that somebody wants to raise uh, that Dr. Mira would be willing to... Yes, sir. i just say who you are, if you wouldn't yes, mind. Yeah. Um, Brian Jordan from the Immigrant Council of Ireland. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your presentation and for your, your leadership on the issue in, in, the, in the EU and the Commission. It's uh, unbelievable to have somebody so articulately describe what so many of us working in the area feel so strongly about um, I'm just wondering, I have a general question about the context of the migration situation that's going on in Europe at the moment and some of the measures that have been taken, such as the EU-Turkey deal, for example, about the, 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 the focus being on as quickly as possible repatriating people back to, to Turkey who are not seen as being genuine asylum seekers, and as well the kind of suggestions around some NATO presence between Libya and Italy has been a deterrent to boats to send them back to North Africa. Would you have concerns in those kind of situations that, that anybody in those boats or anybody in those kind of uh, situations who may be victims of trafficking are never going to get detected? They're never going to get kind of seen, but very quickly get turned around and sent back into a very difficult situation. And there's no, the, the, the focus is on deterrence as opposed to assistance or identification. Mm. I actually think that's a very straightforward answer because it's not, I don't need to politicize that. I have concerns that victims of trafficking are not identified anywhere in the EU as much as they should. So of course I have concerns that when you have a huge influx of people, irrespective of where they come from, where they go, or where they might end up to, uh, a lot of them end up not being identified. And we all know that if you have people who are extremely vulnerable, then the possibility of them being used by exploiters is higher. But I can reverse the question and ask you how many of them are identified at the entry point when they, when they enter the EU. We have identification guidelines for border guards, for consular services, for uh, mig uh, migration officials, etc. We have extremely good NGOs. We have very good police service, uh, services who know what a victim of trafficking looks like. You know, hint, hint, I don't know which country I'm in. That's a good... Uh, that's a good mm. example. That happens all over the EU all the time. It's not just now. Um, so I would tell you that, yes, of course I have concerns, but they're not any different to the concerns that I would have for people coming in or the concerns that I have from, for people not identified who are EU citizens within the EU. And in fact, um, we've been talking about, I want to just maybe um, focus on one issue, which is on child trafficking. For the last five years, in this uh, strategy, we've been focusing on children so much, a lot of deliverables, a lot of work talking about child protection systems. The minute that someone wrote somewhere in the press that there's 10,000 children that may be exploited sexually from third countries now into the EU, it became a huge issue. It is a huge issue, but it's not a new huge issue. The fact that children are exploited for sexual, ex uh, they are trafficked for sexual exploitation is not new at all. What at least this has done is that it has highlighted the ply, the, the, the horrifying situation that children find themselves into. So I think what we can do is use this as a, as a momentum to ensure that what we have promised, uh, what member states have pr promised to do, what they have put together to do, uh, they implement. And I think once we implement what we have in place, I'm not here to give you some big glory, pay. oh yes, let's, let's do something else. On the no, we have everything that we need to do. I don't want to bore you with the different criteria and guidelines and publications and whatever we have. We have funding available. So who's going to do it? And who's going to ensure that it is being done? Would, would it help, uh, Mar Maria, if... if um, when people are being processed now through this process of Greece versus Turkey and the <coughs> EU and Italy, there's a, there's a big emphasis now to see if anybody is a terrorist and has been slipped in, as it were, into the system. Would it help if there was more emphasis put on identifying people who are trafficked that it becomes an issue? I mean, last week we had the Minister for, Just, for Home Affairs from Malta, and Malta began to get those boats landing on their seashores back in 2002, and the rest of us in Europe kind of ignored it for years and let them get on with it themselves. Um, 
there needs to be some kind of particular focus to wake us up. And sadly, it was the picture of that little three-year-old boy on the beach that, let's be frank, made us all realise that there were people dying every day on the seas uh, trying to get into Europe. So maybe if an effort was made to identify as people are applying for asylum or being processed in, in, in Greece or wherever, that if they're trafficked, it becomes one of the issues that, that is highlighted. So it maybe opens up the, the market a bit more to understand it. Well, absolutely. I think, I think I, we were talking informally before yeah. that we find what we look for. Whatever we want to look for in the end, whether it's your car keys or whether they're victims of trafficking, you need to look for something to find it. And sometimes you see it and it's in front of you, but you don't want to see it as well. Because we do a number of things, tricks to feel better about ourselves. And I think the minute we decide that we need to focus on this issue, and, and it's very good to use this example from Malta because it's similar to the example I gave on children. The minute this number of 10,000 children came in the press, I received more <coughs> questions on children in two weeks than I did in five years. And I was thinking, Why? but there's tens of thousands of children potentially being trafficked in the EU all the la last five years. I'm not undermining the importance of is equally important, but all children are the same. And we should be focusing on all children equally at all times. So it's a question of prioritizing. And I think our priorities at all times in anything we do should be the most vulnerable mm -hmm. in the way I understand it. Any other questions or comments? You've given us such a lot of information and facts <laughs> that I think that people are... Yes, I had a yes. question even yes. though it's to a colleague, yeah. colleague Barbara Nolan from yeah. the European Commission. I was very surprised to hear that Germany hasn't transposed the um, directive. I mean, it's not usually one of the offending countries in terms of transposition of EU legislation. And I was just wondering, are there specific circumstances around that? Um, and I mean, obviously it would be of concern given the huge influx of uh, migrants into Germany now. Well, we are in touch with the German authorities. They, they are working on the issue. The, they have now introduced a draft law that is being discussed. I cannot tell you more about it because it has to be first notified to, to, to the Commission. And I know that the colleagues are working, and I know that it's a very complex piece of legislation. And I understand in the sense that it deals with prevention, it deals with prosecution, it deals with, uh, with uh, protection of victims. So it's a complex uh, issue in a, in a big country. But of course, we urge all member states to ensure uh, proper transposition, not because I'm in the EU and I'm in the Commission and I want transposition of the directive, but because there's human lives at stake. The moment we have law, the moment then we can implement the law and hopefully help some people. So I would urge all the member states in exactly the same way to do so. Is it, is it the fact that where prostitution is legal in a country, that there's a better chance that the users of prostitutes would be willing to go to the police when they think the women they're, they're using for sex are trafficked. I mean, there'd be an embarrassment factor here, I would imagine, if men are, are going to go to the police and say, well, by the way, I was at my lunchtime today somewhere. I told the story downstairs. A friend of mine moved to a country town, big country town, and has discovered that one of the apartments behind them is definitely being used uh, for sexual um, mm. trafficking and men are going in and out of it at lunchtime. But none of those, I think, are going to go to the Garda station in this town and say, by the way, I was in somewhere at lunchtime today and I think this, the girl I was using was victim. Is, is there a different kind of sense of it in the countries where prostitution is legal? Okay, um, what I can say, first of all, is that the, the Commission has no competence when it comes to prostitution policy of the member states. Mm. However, it has a competence when it comes to the exploitation of the prostitution of others. And in many instances, not all, uh, there is the element of exploitation of the prostitution of others. What we know is that, and, and some people say, oh, it's very political. It's not political. This is what the law enforcement says and Europol says, so I buy it. It's, Prostitution is a very high-risk sector. I'm not here to say that whether it's legal or not legal, uh, it's better or worse. This is not for me to say. But prostitution is a very high-risk sector. And unless we identify uh, that and we accept that, we are not able to help the people uh, who are in this sector. I talked about fisheries before. Nobody said, oh, no, you're discriminating against the fishermen or women. Well, fishermen, mostly. Um, 
So why would it be the case here? It's a very high-risk sector. A lot of people in prostitution are trafficked. Are they the majority or the minority? I don't know, but really, the question is to go and proactively ensure that there is no trafficking happening in these places. I am more concerned about countries that don't have a debate on these issues at all. That is like, it just happens, you know, no, there's trafficking for sexual exploitation, and they don't talk about it. I am happier where uh, countries, one way or another, they talk about it and they discuss it and they find a way to address the demand that fosters these forms of this form of exploitation. Because we have to, of course, sometimes people don't know, but come on, sometimes we know. For all forms of exploitation, I think we do know in many instances. Uh, and I think the more the law has this normative effect and the more we prosecute and convict perpetrators or those <coughs> who exploit victims, uh, the more likely we are to have a deterrent effect on this. On this. I hate to put you in the, in the spot, uh, Claire, but <laughs> how many, uh, have there been many prosecutions for trafficking as opposed to some of the allied crimes that go with it in this well, country? There's been, there's been a very small number. In yeah. fact, our lead um, prosecution has uh, been trafficking. Peter, yes. Simon, but yes. as much yes. as I hate to do so. Yes, yeah, well, you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Peter, yes. Uh, well, there haven't been that many actual prosecutions for the offence of trafficking as defined in the legislation. Uh, mainly because it's a very particularly difficult to get all the proofs to mm. prove the particular offence. But normally, um, uh, when we have a file like that where you know, it's trafficking, is, the, is, is generally what you're seeing mm. on the page, um, there would be some other offence that would be prosecuted for. But with a different um, sentence. So. Oh, yes, well, different the, sentences. Well, serious stuff uh, such as organising prostitution. Um, yeah. I can't remember the exact. For that. I don't think it's 10 years. It's, uh, yes, so, so, so there are. So the, yeah. you know, and, and, and penalties in our general sense tend to be relatively low compared to other, for any events, <coughs> than other countries might be. Mm. So I'm not sure it would make sense. So it's kind of you make choices that trafficking as a crime is very hard to have a high level of proof and therefore you move to oh, no, another I'm element. I'm of not it. saying that it's hard and high level. Proof. There is a high level of proof, mm. and that's not always there. Yes. So you can't prosecute. But you can prosecute for something else, and that will. Uh, and you do that in that case was, you can't do any prosecution. Well, yeah. That was nothing. Yeah? Yes, yeah. And this is what I think you're finding happening, isn't it? It, it yeah. happens, but what I but I also hear from prosecutors, and I'm not one myself, so I don't claim expertise, but they say, so, first of all, when it comes to the directive, it says that the, the testimony of the victim is not, to put it very plainly, is not, very, is not <coughs> necessary for the, for the prosecution of the, of the perpetrator. It makes it, of course, a lot more difficult. But here is one area, for example, where we could use financial investigations a lot more. When you start looking early on, in the investigation and then in the prosecution, when you start looking for uh, uh, conducting uh, financial investigations and you actually follow the money early on, some prosecutors have told us that this can give a lot better results in terms of evidence in court than even sometimes the victim's testimony would, that often they don't tell the whole truth, they're scared, they may mm. think that they will be deported, etc., etc. <coughs> so sometimes looking for other um, uh, investigative techniques and also uh, conducting financial investigations early on <coughs> can be helpful. Now, I'm not saying that this is the easiest thing on earth, mm. but I am saying that human trafficking is a Euro crime. So we need to, and it's a serious form of crime, and we need to become a lot more proactive in all the member states and throughout in prosecuting the crime in itself. <coughs> and I really, I, I think of cases of, you know, before legislation on, on domestic violence in some member states where it was more, you know, for bodily harm and then et cetera, et cetera. There are crimes that took a long time to admit to ourselves that mm. we had crimes ahead of us, including rape. And we managed to put that. How would we prove? It's an intimate... <coughs> Nobody we else don't is in talk the room, about that yes. Yeah. Yes, mm. and now we, we started understanding, maybe a little bit too late for the victims, but uh, we understand a lot more the need for prosecution. It's not the same when it comes to trafficking because this is a serious form of organized crime, as opposed to the other, the other two, and very profitable, but also it gives a window of opportunity when it comes to following the money in this investigation mm -hmm. path. I think... 
Yeah. Yes, yes, Peter. Yeah. I might just add to the question of Irish investment and following the money. Uh, the, the, there is provision in the Irish legislation post conviction for an application to be made to court for the confiscation of the, of, yes. of the proceeds of the crime. What else? Whatever has right. been the benefit to the person. So if you can prove what that process, what that. Uh, Yes, but that's post hoc when you have luckily got a conviction. I think the majority before, is yes. that uh, all avenues of, uh, yeah. say, game, mm. uh, bank accounts, yeah. you know, the business that yeah. went on. Yeah, yeah. based on the national legislation, of yes. course. Yeah. 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 And travel patterns and all sorts of things, you know. Absolutely. Well, look, I think we've probably uh, had such a, a, a great amount of information and 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 stuff to ponder on ourselves, all of us, because I know looking around the room, there's a great range of skills and, and expertise in this room. And we need to, you know, constantly be aware that even though we're a small island on the edge of Ireland, we're not immune from having people who are trafficked here, both for labour reasons, for sexual reasons, for, 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 a, for a number of other reasons. And we must be careful and we must examine our own consciences, all of us. Um, lest we might inadvertently be assisting in some form of, of trafficking and exploitation. So I want to thank Dr. Mira very much indeed for the great work you're doing and wish you well. I know when your report comes out, it will get some uh, coverage. Um, you know, it mightn't be as much as you would hope for, but it will be another way in which we highlight this uh, heinous um, and awful crime of, of people trafficking for, as I say, all sorts of reasons. So we thank you for coming here to Ireland and That's talking to us. And thank you all very much for being here.